So many of you know that I am the youngest of three. There is my middle brother, David, who is six years older than I am, and my oldest brother, Jay, who is nine years older than I am. And so growing up, they obviously would do their own thing, and a lot of time I would kind of do my own thing. But it was amazing. It was wonderful, those moments that they let me play with them, that they said, hey, Patrick, you want to come do this? The answer always was yes. Absolutely. I definitely want to do it. Whatever it is, I definitely want to do it. And so when they said, hey, Patrick, do you want to come play football? I said, yes, absolutely. This is definitely what I want to do. And so this is what football entailed when you have the three of us playing it. You'd have Jay over here, and you'd have David over here, and they'd be throwing it back and forth, and I'd be running, sort of monkey in the middle kind of thing, a little bit. And then eventually, one of them would catch the ball and then make like he was accidentally dropping it, but dropping it on purpose. Whoops! Fumble! And the ball would go on the ground. I would run, jump on the ball, and then pick it up and not know what to do. And so they'd go, run toward the other one. So if I'm with David, I would run toward Jay, and uh, David would run after me. So I'm running toward Jay this way. David would run after me, and what they would do is they would take their hand, and, well, here, I'll do it like this. So I'm running, boop, 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 and they would take their, they would take their, their arm, and they would sweep my legs out, and I would fling the ball up, and I would go flying. And this was good fun for everybody. I didn't care because I was, uh, you know, I was playing with them and they got to torture their little brother. So everybody won, right? So one day we're playing this game, right? Football. And I get the ball from Jay and I'm running toward David. And I decide, split second, didn't even think about it beforehand. I decide, you know what? I'm going to do something different. He's not going to cut the legs out from under me this time. And so from full sprint with Jay behind me, I just stop. I'm full sprinting, and then I just stop. And in the split second before it happened, I thought to myself, this was a really good idea. This was super smart of me. What happened, of course, was that my 15-year-old brother slammed full speed into me he and I and the ball fell on the ground, and all three of them landed on my left arm. I went, ah! And then the time-honored tradition of siblings everywhere kicks in, right? You don't even think about it. It just happens. David and Jay swooped over to me in unbelievably caring and loving mode. And they say, oh, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? Don't tell mom. Come on, get up, get up. Let's make sure, you, oh, oh, get all this dust to get all this grass off of you. Don't tell mom. How's your arm? Can you do this? Don't tell mom. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, it hurts a little bit? Okay, well then don't do that. Don't tell mom. And they continued on this way. And I, I said, you know, guys, I don't, I don't think I want to play football anymore. And they said, oh, you know what? Why don't you go inside uh, Sesame Street, right? Why don't you watch Sesame Street? Don't tell mom. And why don't you, uh, do you need something? Can we get you some chocolate milk or something? Would that be okay? Well, yeah, that would be great. So we go inside, and I'm sitting there watching Sesame Street. And this is exactly, uh, this is exactly what uh, brothers do, right? This, not just brothers. This is exactly what siblings do. Do, right? This kind of thing where you are, uh, you are figuring out ways that you can have fun, and it's not, maybe not 100% at the other person's expense, but maybe. And just so you don't think that there is some sort of uh, evil gang up against poor saintly Patrick, around the same time, we were at my grandmother, our grandmother's house, and uh, she had this sort of tree, the sort of uh, rudimentary tree house kind of thing in her backyard, not very high off the ground, but the two older boy, two older brothers would jump up, would climb up and jump off of it. Well, I thought it would be hilarious when David was jumping off one time to try and dart underneath him while he's jumping to see if I could do that. And I, I wasn't really trying to hurt him. But I did want to mess with him, right? I mean, he's my older brother. That's what you do. He wound up uh, spraining or breaking his ankle. I don't remember. It was bad. And uh, so this is, 
this is the kind of stuff, I'm sure if you have siblings or cousins, you have stories like this, probably much uh, more elaborate and interesting, but this is what I thought of, and this is the kind of thing that I thought about, that there is some innate competition, some innate sense in which we are constantly judging and and placing ourselves against our siblings and finding their fault because when you live with someone you can't help but see all of the good and the bad in them so you you find their faults and you find their strengths and you see all of it and we can't help but see ourselves in comparison to that we're starting a new series this morning the series is going to be a look at the life of joseph now there are two big josephs in the bible one Uh, is the husband of Mary, and that's the Christmas story, Joseph. That's not the one we're talking about. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, and talk about the life of Joseph. Now, if you know anything of this Joseph, you probably know that he had a coat of many colors. And that is where we are going to start in our scripture today, is from there. But before we get to scripture, you need to understand how we got here. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are starting to set up the whole world, literally. You have creation, you have Noah, you have all of these different accounts that are told on this grand and literally global scale. Starting in chapter 12, and for the rest of the book, the last 38 chapters of Genesis are all about this family line. And it starts with Abram, who becomes Abraham, Father Abraham, And Abraham has a son, he actually has two, the youngest one named Isaac is the one we follow, and from Isaac, he has a son, well, he actually has two, and the youngest one, Jacob, is the one we follow, so Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, and the one we're going to follow is named Joseph. So, if you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn to Genesis chapter 37 as we begin our scripture reading today. Uh, As always, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It is Genesis chapter 37. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. So Jacob had, uh, had different wives, and each of the wives had given him sons. And that's important because the, the stepbrothers here, uh, or half-brothers, are going to be the ones who um, have the uh, sort of drive the action of the story. J- but jo- <laughs> they, he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brother was doing. Is that not the most little brother move in the world? I am going to tell mom. I'm going to tell dad, right? Like, that's the move. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. Now, the King James uh, translates this a a robe or a coat of many colors. The Hebrew here is a little bit confusing in terms of what it exactly is describing. But what it does mean is this kind of coat is not something that you give to a 17-year-old, number one. And number two, it's not something you give to a shepherd. Remember, he was helping to tend the flocks. This is the kind of coat you give to someone who who isn't going to do manual labor. It's too heavy and burdensome and ornate and fancy. And so in giving Joseph this coat, Jacob is signaling that he no longer is going to be the one who has to go and work for his brothers. He is setting him apart for something different. He is clearly showing him to be the favorite child. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Literally, they couldn't say 
uh, peace to him, which in Hebrew is shalom. Shalom is also the way that you say hello. They literally are not interested in making peace, in speaking peace to Joseph. You probably, if you have siblings or cousins, know this example and know this moment where the last thing in the world you want to do is make peace. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. This is the most 17-year-old thing ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field trying, tying up bundles of grain, and <laughs> this is the craziest thing. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be king, do you? You think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I had another dream. The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed low before me. And this time he told his dream to his father, the one who gave him the coat, the one who saw him as his favorite, and his father scolded him. Uh, what kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to, a pa went to pasture their father's flocks in Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob sent to Joseph, said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. Why isn't Joseph with them? That's right, because when he got the coat, he suddenly doesn't have to do the yard work, the work out in the field anymore. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said, Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. This would have been about a 10 to 20 mile walk that he was doing. While he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for, he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they are pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man replied. They've moved on from here. But I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So another area that they went was, uh, they went a little bit further to Dothan. And so that's where Joseph is now going to find them. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of the scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our, without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. Now, before you get any ideas about how saintly Reuben is and how the rest of the brothers are all awful, uh, you may on your own want to go read Genesis 35, and there's one tiny verse in there that may give you a clue as to why Reuben is in the bad graces of his dad, Jacob, and why he may be using this as a way to get it back. We don't have time for it, but uh, if you're curious, you just read through Genesis 35, and the verse will pop out to you. So, uh, they, when, so when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah, one of them, said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? This is, you know, it, it just gets worse and worse, right? Let's kill him. Wait a minute. Is killing him really the best thing we could do? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. <laughs> See, the, Judah is trying to come off here as sort of, how do you spin this? Like, <laughs> killing him's bad. You know what's better? Selling him into slavery. He is our flesh and blood, after all. And the brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brother pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. 
and the traitors took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern, and when he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, The boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in the blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Doesn't this robe belong to my bro- our brother? Could be said, but they don't see him. They have disconnected themselves from him. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Then fa- the, their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph was, has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. So, lots of pieces moving here, lots of stuff going on. One of the things I want you to pay attention to is there are no innocent parties in this, right? You have the father, Jacob, who is doting and showing favoritism to Joseph. And in doing that, he is cutting off the other brothers from seeing that they are special and wonderful and connected to to him as well. He is focusing all of his love on Joseph. The brothers are so jealous of that that it leads them to take a rash action, that instead of dealing with it, that their, their jealousy then bubbles over so much that they decide they should kill Joseph. But even that, they don't need to kill him. What, what happens if we kill him? It's just going to cause more work for us. We'll have to cover up the crime. So instead, let's turn a profit off of getting rid of our brother. And Joseph himself is so arrogant about his own interests and his own desire that he doesn't, he can't read the room and see what's going on and what's happening. All of this bubbles over and all of this explodes from this family that is not paying attention to all of the stuff going on in their world. We know this in our own world as well. And as even though some of us would, uh, you know, we will, some of us will go to our graves refusing to believe that emotions matter and that our feelings care. It's just simply not true. We know that how you deal with your own inner stuff is going to affect how you make relationships work, especially with the people closest to us in our family. If you aren't dealing with the brokenness inside you, if you aren't dealing with the hurt that you have, then you can't help but spread that hurt to others. We see that in Jacob hurting the brothers and the brothers hurting Joseph and Joseph hurting the brothers back. All of this happens because of the brokenness that they see. All of this happens because they refuse to deal with what's going on in their own lives. Now, up to this point, it sounds like I'm saying they should have all sat down with the therapist. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if we aren't aware of the sinfulness and brokenness in our own hearts and in our own lives, then we can't help but spread that brokenness to others. That's just the fact of it. Sin has fractured our, the pieces of us and the jagged edges of ourself can't help but cut others if we aren't aware of them and careful with them. This is what happens here, and this pours out in so many different ways. And even after they sell Joseph off into slavery, the brothers thought, and their plan was, if we get rid of Joseph, then our dad will finally give us the attention and the love that we want. But what happens? All it does, when it seems like Joseph is dead, all it does is cement that he is the favorite. The brothers are turned away again. Over and over, the brokenness and the jaggedness that causes us to hurt and cut others doesn't lead us to the peace that we seek. Because whether we care about emotions or not, what we are seeking is peace. What we are seeking is wholeness. And we can either have that room in our house where we 
don't let anybody see because we keep the door closed because that's where all the junk is. We can pretend like that's the way to live and that's how we need to do. Or we can do the hard step, the adult thing of asking God to look at and see the brokenness in our lives and asking God to work on redeeming it. But it's interesting to talk about God because there is a question. I, I read this big, long chapter, right? This is much longer than what we've been reading recently in part of sermons. God isn't mentioned. God isn't talked about. God isn't, where is God in the midst of this, right? Because this is a dysfunctional family, right? You think your family is broken. If you never tried to sell your sibling off into slavery, then, you know, you might be a step or two below where their family is, right? But where is God in the midst of this? Well, God is the same place where God is now. God is constantly and with complete effort at all times working for the good of those who love him to bring about God's purposes and bring about God's kingdom. God is working in the background. So how does God work in the background? God works in the background because where they wound up was in Dothan, right? Now to us, Dothan doesn't mean anything. I know it's a city in Alabama, but other than that, I don't know anything about Dothan from biblical times, except this one handy fact. Dothan was a rest stop on the trade route between Gilead and Egypt. It was not just a random encounter. Dothan was a rest stop. So when the, when, the, uh, when the brothers were sitting down and they see Joseph coming, they don't just see Joseph. They're going to see traders coming consistently. I have a picture in my mind of them sitting on a hill and seeing this trail of, uh, of traders going back and forth on, on this road near where this rest stop is. And that's when they get the idea, hey, but why would they be there? Well, my argument would be that there's no such thing as coincidence, and God is working and moving, and this isn't God's desire is for them to, you know, hurt and harm their brother. But even our broken, jagged edges, God can use and build something new out of. Even when we have made the biggest mess of our life and the life of others, when we humbly turn to God, God can renew it and transform it and use it in ways we can't imagine. I, and, and you and I can uh, debate this and discuss this if you're interested, but I believe that God gives us the freedom to choose every single minute of every single day what we want to do. But I believe that every time we choose, God then shows up and says, okay, I've reworked the plan so that I can get you there. You know how, maybe you don't do this, but I do this. When you're using a GPS, and this is going to, okay. So even when I use a GPS, I still take wrong turns. I'm just going to say it. If you already don't like me, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. You're going to gossip anyway. But if you love me, then you love me. So uh, even when I'm using a GPS, I will still take a wrong turn. And what happens when you do it? At least um, Google Maps doesn't anymore. But, you know, it used to have that <sighs> recalculating, okay, you know, just... Wherever you want to go is fine, but if you actually want to get to the place, I'd go this way, right? That sort of uh, sassiness. But now the sassiness is gone, right? So I, I see it now most of the time, because I only do it occasionally. But when, when we are going somewhere and we have the GPS on for a long trip and we decide we need to stop and get gas, right? So, you get, so you're going to stay on this interstate for another 100 miles. Well, we're taking exit 34. And Google Maps goes, okay, so you got off at exit 34. What I need you to do is make, make this U-turn right here and get right back on to the interstate. And, and you go, nope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this gas station down here. And Google Maps goes, okay, no problem. So I need you to get back on the road and get, get, get back on the interstate. And then we say, gosh, Chick-fil-A's right there. Why don't I go a little further down? And every single time, what Google Maps does is goes, okay, so we're just going to do this instead. This can still get you where you need to go. I, don't thi I think we think of God as the old GPS voice going, there he goes again. All right. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to take you this way. But that's not who our God is. 
our God, even in the midst of our jagged, broken pieces that hurt others. And, and honestly, by the way, if you've decided that you're just not going to work on yourself, then I think you need to talk to God about how much you actually love your neighbor because the broken pieces of you wind up hurting other people. So if you're too arrogant and selfish to actually work on yourself, then probably what that means is you really love yourself more than you love your neighbor, which I don't think is God's desire for us. But the GPS piece that we need is not God giving us attitude or giving us lip. That's not who God is. That's what sinful nature does. What God does is continually and completely over and over and over again say, wherever you are, okay, I can bring you. The second you decide, nope, I want to get back on the interstate. I want to get back on the way that's going. God says, I've got the plan and I've already worked it out. That's what God does. That's who God is. So when we look and we see the story where God uses Joseph being sold into slavery to save not only the whole region, but save his family, the very people who did this to him, it's not that God stood up in heaven and decided, you know what needs to happen? Joseph needs to go into slavery. <laughs> what God saw was through sinfulness and brokenness, people made horrible choices, and God still said, the second you turn back to me, I can get you where you need to go, and you're going to do something amazing. Because life itself is beautiful and amazing. Most of the times, we don't pay attention to it. We get so caught up in other things, but life itself is beautiful and amazing, and living your life for God takes you into a place of faithfulness where you can serve deeply and richly and fully. And that's God's promise to you, is that whatever wrong turns you have made, however you have hurt yourself or hurt others, whatever jagged edges still remain in you, the second you decide, I want to get back on the right path, God has a route mapped out for you already. That's what our God does. Our God uses the brokenness of our lives, the brokenness of our family, and the brokenness of our world for his own purposes. Not, and, and the Apostle Paul said, um, you know, if God shows me grace when I sin, shouldn't I just sin a whole bunch more so that God can show me a whole much more grace? And then the Apostle Paul answers his own question and goes, no, that's not at all what God wants for you. Don't do that. God still wants you to work on the broken places that hurt you and hurt others because those are still wounds that are real. That is still destruction that you have to answer for and you have to address. But there is no wound, there is no destruction, there is nothing that is so permanent that it can keep you from God's redeeming love. The second you are ready to get back on the right road, God has already routed you the way. That is, what, that is where God is working. That is how God is moving, is that what we see and what we, if, if we were there and we heard, listened very quietly to the Holy Spirit move and work among all that was happening, what we would see and what we would hear is rerouting. I will still get you there. Let's pray. God, I am overwhelmed that my brokenness not only can't bar me forever from you, but it can't even keep me from where you are calling me to go. God, I name and address as best I can every day the jagged edges and the broken pieces of my life, the places where I have made a mess of things. And I invite you to come in and redeem and change it. But God, I also ask that even through the mess, you show me the right route. You show me how to go. You show me what to do. Show me, God, where you are calling me to go, who you are calling me to be, and who you are calling me to serve. We love you, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.